What's up, world? Welcome. What kind of world do we really want? Do we desire to live in the shadows of life? Or would we rather live in the blissful, blessed balm of the radiant sun? If we choose to live in fear, we have, in effect, decided to live in a similar bondage of the Hebrews back during the heyday of Egyptian rule. We will present today a panacea or a cure-all for all things from the deviant to the delightful. And it stands erected on the impregnable base that has stood the test of time, and that is love. Stay awake, my friends. You can sleep later. We'll be back. about anything is an investigative analysis of an event. But it is not until we understand why it was necessary that it matters. Too many times people spend an exorbitant amount of hours trying to ascertain facts from an event. Their goal is to, in some way, bring a kind of unity to clarifying their ideas about a particular event. This will lead to discussion, gathering information from a variety of sources, many times without even checking the validity or the veracity of those sources. We have to always remember that a story is only as good or as credible as the source which provided it. We seem to have an insatiable desire to craft a story or a saga about someone or something that we probably do not have great admiration for. And that drives us into places where we provide all kinds of embellishment to the story because it is important that the story arrests the attention of those who might be exposed to it. All of us should take great solace in knowing God does not appraise any life because of one or two events. Because he has the eternal audacity to, and the divine prerogative to do whatever he wants. It's wonderful to know that we serve a God who does not look at our lives in snapshots of time. God is able to see all of our lives at one time because he placed all of the capabilities that we have within us. Our mental environment was crafted by God. God placed the enormous emotional capabilities that we possess. He's responsible. Isn't it wonderful to know that we never surprise God? We might surprise humans but we never surprise God. Humans can be surprised by the way we may execute certain things, but what makes God so special? God never stops at the event. He always considers the impetus of that event or succinctly the why. The why of every event is what changes the event from one category to another. For example, if one should shoot a gun by accident in a home and strike someone in their body and they die, it is viewed very differently if someone with premeditation plans to come and execute a murder on someone. One is considered an accidental shooting other one is the result of willful volition, malice, and forethought. 
we see the result of the event is the same. The person who got struck with the bullet died in both instances. But because they were motivated by two different wills, they are not viewed the same way even in man's court. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to pause and take time to discover why did the event take place and what was the necessity? What was the purpose for which it was executed? Now, this is where we need to start. Even Paul reminds us in Corinthians that he would debase himself if it meant winning someone over to Christ. He would choose to be a slave. He would choose to become whatever was necessary as long as the purpose for which it was done was to bring a wayward life to Christ. It is therefore important for all of us to make sure we do not engage in garrulous judging and this irresponsible idea of judging people and events because we are not capable of seeing beyond the surface of that event. We are shackled with limited minds. That's why it is important that we leave certain things in the hands of God. We have to learn to be comfortable with those things being in his hands. For he knows what we do not know. He is privy to what we are not privy to. And it is his prerogative to respond to that event as he deems appropriate. The most important thing for us to do is to learn to recognize and accept the power of love. You cannot legislate love. You cannot tax people to make them love. You cannot force people to live in certain communities, to be around a certain people. If they choose not to be there, that's okay. Bottom line is love does not come from a system of institutionalized development. It is an individual desire that only is constructed by having a relationship with a higher authority. That higher authority is what we as children of God call Christians. Stay awake. The Renaissance Shoe by JGE was inspired by the rise of Kamala Harris, our Vice President-elect of the United States of America. Get a pair at aliveshoes.com backslash renaissance dash by dash JGE dash one. to recognize who and what 
has possession of our being. Before probing into the spiritual aspect of this presentation, I would like for us to consider our present existential moment. Although institutionalized bondage has been removed from our social interactions today, thank God, there still is a quest for the economic, political, and emotional leaders to hold some sense of dominance over other people. Many times, this is expressed in the hubris attitudes of those who feel they do not have to follow the prescribed rules of comportment that are upheld by organizations of many types. Some actually believe because they are wealthy or politically connected, the ordinary rules do not apply to them. This is demonstrated often by the thoughts that privileges are the results of wealth and that does not relate to people who are not as well off. When one cannot exercise patience in standing in a line and feeling of having to wait like others are beneath them, something is wrong. Now listen, this is not limited nor directed at any particular ethnicity. This is an area that includes people from all walks of life. Then we go to the next step. Let's consider our interpersonal relationships. There are those who seem to forget that people probably have established relationships with others before they met their current emotional partner. Many relationships have gone through many unpleasant moments because of either some emotional insecurity or because of the jealousy of special friendships of another type their partner might have with someone other than them. This is a type of relationship that, that I kind of call the person possession. Person possession just might be present, which simply means somebody feels like because you are married to them that they own you. It is a paramount concern for all of us to understand if we fail to own ourselves, someone will gladly do so. Emotional relationships are important in our lives, but they are not to be controlling nor manipulative. Loving your emotional partner is very special, but it should not cause any of us to debase ourselves in the process. Love should be individualistic and not institutional. In other words, our mates should not present us a mold and we are to pour ourselves into it. We should not have to be subjected to an idea of love from someone or from some place other than ourselves and we are required to fashion ourselves accordingly. The most beautiful relationship anyone can have with a significant other is being able to live interact and converse with all people without innuendo, supposition, or incessant inquisition. Adults should have the right to be an adult, like making some decisions without being challenged or asked to explain themselves. Further, we should consider that most people learn how to love in an environment that was different from ours. They were probably taught about love from other parents who may have different values and different experiences than our parents. And the collision of spirits with diametrically opposing backgrounds can surely create a difference in the way we approach life. 
I also suggest that young ladies and young men, if possible, should meet the mothers and fathers of their potential mates. The purpose of this meeting is designed to get a sense of the source who presented love to your potential mate. This might assist in explaining the construction of your mate's reality. Having an idea of how we desire our futures to look like depends largely on the decisions we make today. We can love and be a great supportive mate to someone without leaving our values or wholesome interests. And it's okay to talk to friends, laugh with others, Great mates respect the privacy of their mate because love is a respectful state. So let's love with respect. Let's love with passion and compassion. Let's love with forgiveness. Let's love with our giving and our living. The main point is for us to own our being, know our value, and never settle on dancing to music that's not music to your ears. We'll be right back. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Hello, I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank all of our wonderful viewers. You have been magnificent. I'm asking you now to go to jge.com and you can be directed to how to give to our ministry. You can simply go to jge.com, click on donate, fill in your information, and click twice and it will go to our cause. We are asking each of you to send us $20, just $20. This would help us tell our story around the world and to bring unity to all of God's people. We have a bold agenda, but we can do it because nothing is impossible with God. Remember, jge.com, click on Donate, Fill out the information, click on Donate Twice, and it will be sent to our causes. Thank you so much for what we know you are going to do. God bless. Welcome back. Only a genuinely loving person can love every person. Human slavery was not enforced by the chains and shackles around the necks of some only, but more so by the dark souls residing in solitary confinement whose minds could not even imagine that they too lived in denied freedom without even having the awareness of being a slave to a social sickness and a patient in an abstract psychiatric ward without any treatment available. The ugly acts of those who believe in racial superiority is the beauty of enlightenment to those who did not believe such notions existed at all. This is what leads us to trying to understand the standards of love that was created by Jesus, the Son of God. In the Gospels, it records, if you all would permit me, that he is called Jesus. That's his personal name by birth. That was the name he had when he entered the world. Its basic meaning means Savior, salvation. 
It is designed to show us that he delivers, he sets us free, he makes us safe. Yes, it does speak of reproach, suffering, and shame, but it is the New Testament equivalent of Joshua. This precious name occurs nearly 700 times in the New Testament, over 600 times in the Gospels alone. How do we count for the infrequent use of the peerless name in the epistles? Well, it's due to the new position Jesus had in the epistles, which was risen and exalted. Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, is the name used in the epistles for the new position of Jesus as risen Savior. These titles are used upward of 200 times. Jesus alone is about 40 times in the epistles. Christ, which is the Hebrew word, with the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, meaning anointed. This occurs about 50 times in the Gospels as compared to about 300 times in the epistles. Christ. He's not an official designation or title. It is usually written with the article prefix as the Christ. When Jesus asked his disciples, whom say ye that I am, Peter replied that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus Christ is a sort of double tail that appears about five or six times in the Gospels, but it's frequently used by Paul, Peter, and John in their letters, the lowly, humble man on earth. But Jesus now is the exalted, glorified man in the heavens as Christ. What life was like as Jesus versus what life was like as Christ we find a combination of suffering on earth and the glories of heaven. How wondrously linked all of this is in the divine order of things and is demonstrated in the word Jesus Christ. God calls us to love without condition. Love despite of what you do not understand. Love in the midst of failures and in the midst of pain. Love not because it's convenient. Love not because it feels good. But we love because it is the word of God and it is the expectation that God has for every member of our society. Yes, we should love with all that we have and all that we are. Because as a child of God, we are often called to do some things that are not convenient. We're called to do some things that may not even make sense to us. Oh yes, we may not even fully understand what God really wants us to do. But we have to remember when God calls us to do something, he infuses his presence into our being. It is out of our faith and out of our trust in him that we are doing what he has called us to do. We are to remember we are his ambassadors. We have to be God's mouthpiece to bring the consciousness of his presence to our world. Somebody asked, how in the world can I love somebody who hates everything about me? The answer to that is, anyone can love someone who's loving them back. That doesn't require a great deal of strength, certainly requires no real skill. It is simply an intuitive response. When someone loves you, we have the tendency to at least try to love them back. But I want us to close by 
understanding this. We, we do not love because we have a reason to. God calls us to love amid hateful actions. Love those who despitefully use you. And that requires the presence of God. It should be stated that God does not intend for us to be able to reach all of the standards he has set for us on our own. Thank God. God knows our limitations and will not allow us to do all the things that our minds may even want to do. Thank God for that. But a transformed mind gives us a starting point. That's the power of faith, the power of grace. When we are not able to reach the standard or maintain that spiritual excellence that God is looking for, thank God we are able to solicit his presence in the process. And when God shows up in the process, Nothing is impossible. I stand today to share with you only what God has revealed to me. I never wanted to be a minister. I never wanted to be a pastor. My personal nature is one of solitude and quietness. But my love for God is greater than my own interests and greater than my own personal comfort. How do we alter our society's trajectory? How do we bring great meaning to our relationships with others? How do we say yes to God when pain accompanies that answer and allows all of our peers around us to suggest that we ought to embrace another idea. The answer to these questions is simple. The call of God suggests that it will be God who will sustain your life and assist you in overcoming your obstacles, arresting your anxieties, and bringing victory in each and every situation. My friends, only God can do that. Give me a little bit more on this mic, brother. Let's do this. I want to hear it.